Welcome back to Analysis, where we're looking at Israel's military response to the recent kidnapping of three teenagers. Toby Cadman and Martin Linton are still with me, and joining us is Diana Neslin from Jews for Justice for Palestine. In this half, we want to look at the broader context of kidnapping, including the ongoing disappearance of Palestinian youths. Every year, between 500 and 700 Palestinian children, some as young as 12, are detained and prosecuted by the Israeli courts. Statistics produced by Defense of Children International show that many of these children are subjected to coercive interrogations, often accompanied by verbal and physical abuse. Um, so, Tony Cameron, this is, uh, this is an underreported, to say the least, side of this story. We hear a massive amount about three uh, children who've disappeared here, but this is an ongoing story and, and one that seems, uh, again, an almost extra legal process as far as Palestinians are concerned. Well, that's right. Um, it is very much underreported, whether we're looking at those held in so-called administrative detention or, or those that simply disappear. Um, it, it is uh, increasingly worrying, the, the numbers. We're aware of several hundred that have, have been arrested are, are in some form of custody. Um, they're not brought before a judge. They're not... Uh, their, their, their custody is not according to a procedure as we would understand it. And so it's very difficult for families to, uh, to take any, any form of legal remedy. And for those that simply disappear, there, there's, there's very little information upon which to act. Um, but it is, as I say, that the numbers are in the hundreds. Mm. Do we have any reliable figures for, I mean, we've given in the intro, we gave the reports, for those are the ones that are brought before the, the courts in some ways, but the disappeared, do we have any estimate of the scale of that? No, I mean, certainly before the, the, the current um, situation uh, occurred, uh, we, we were dealing with, um, and, and personally dealing with, 195 um, individuals um, who are in administrative detention. Those are people that we know about. Mm. Um, but the figures that we have for those that have just simply disappeared where there is no credible information as to their whereabouts, um, depending on the sources, you, you could say anything from, from three to 500 people. Mm. So there, there, there are reports out there of large numbers. Um, but because the, it's very difficult to have credible information as to where they're held, it's very difficult to, to have any definitive number. Mm. Dan, is this an escalating problem? Is it something that's more or less at the same level, or is it something that's, that's getting worse? I, I'm not in a position to say if it's an escalating problem, but it is a problem, certainly the people in military custody. We know that Israel uses administrative detention, which we need to remember started in the British mandate, and they use British mandate law as their guiding force. But we need to realise that they do this deliberately to undermine the political activities of Palestinians. And not only am I a member of Jews for Justice, but I was born in South Africa, and my knowledge of the colonial experience is that you take the leadership out, and that now we have at least 40% of Palestinian men have been imprisoned. This isn't crime. This is the behaviour of a police state and of a colonial state. And I think we need to recognise that, that it's about acting against uh, political, um, the political effect of um, and the political organisation of Palestinians. Mm. I mean, Martin, that must be part of it, mustn't it? I mean, if you, it, any rebellion, any, any kind of intifada, it's going to be a, a, you know, the activists are going to be predominantly young people. If you can take out those people in sufficient numbers, then mm. you, it's a directly uh, aimed political blow at that ability to resist, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. I mean, however much sympathy one ha uh, must have for the three young Israelis who've been kidnapped, and I think we all do, um, there's been almost no press reporting of the, uh, the Palestinian children who are regularly uh, arrested or kidnapped, whichever word you, you like to use. I mean, since the beginning of June, at the same time, there's 17 uh, is Israeli, uh, Palestinian children who've been uh, arrested, sometimes in the middle, in broad daylight, sometimes, uh, you know, arrested in the middle of the night. And... Uh, 
I've, I've met many of these uh, young people and, uh, and heard their descriptions of what's happened to them. And it's clear that uh, not only are they treated very badly, but they're, they're threatened from the beginning of their, their questioning. They're threatened with, with uh, things like, we'll uh, demolish your parents' house if you don't sign this confession. They're faced with a situation where, uh, where they spend, uh, they, they're told they'll be six months in jail if they confess, and they'll be eight months in jail if they don't confess. So uh, they have a, a um, conviction rate of 99.75% in the OFA military court, which I've uh, visited and seen these young people being, uh, being, uh, being convicted. And uh, many of them, of course, are kept in prison under administrative detention as well. They're sent to prisons in Israel where their parents can't visit them. Uh, and this is a, actually a scandal the British government has done a lot to draw attention to. They've done a report on it, but the British media have done very little on this. And it's impossible to understand um, the, w what's going on in, in Israel at the moment without understanding the, the Palestinians' anger at the fact that three Israeli children and the world uh, suddenly takes an interest, 500 Palestinian children a year, and the world doesn't care at all. Mm. I mean, Toby, there's, there's a dislocation here, isn't it? Because you know, if, you, if you think about, you know, as Diana said, if we think about the apartheid state in, in, in South Africa or, or Pinochet, Chile, Chile, nobody expects sort of rule of law here. They're acknowledged tyrannical states. But the, but the Israelis, you know, play on being uh, a democracy, play on being a state where the rule of law I exists. So there's, a, there's an argument that has to be won, which there isn't in some other cases, isn't there? Well, there is, and it is, it is a play. I mean, you, you've only got to listen to some of the statements about this adherence to, to the rule of law, that they're, they're, they're dealing with this to, to ensure the safety of their citizens. Um, and, of course, uh, much of this rhetoric is, is, is just nonsense. Um, the rule of law is not being applied. These individuals are not being brought before courts where their custody can be uh, properly challenged. Um, and, and as we've heard, the, the treatment that many of them suffer with statements being being coerced, being beaten out of uh, young men, um, you, you know, you, you can't have a functional state with, with such treatment. And it is almost as though we're, we're too afraid to ask those questions whenever the, the, the situation concerns Israel. And, and we need to break away from, from that fear. There needs to be uh, proper inquiries in, into this conduct because it is widespread and systematic. Um, these are largely crimes against humanity that are being committed. And we shouldn't be afraid and we shouldn't shy away from that. Um, it, is, it is becoming, uh, I think it is becoming increasingly worse. Um, I'm working on a, a couple of cases myself where young boys are being um, arrested for throwing rocks at vehicles. And there is a particular uh, offence under Israeli law for that, but they're being tried in military courts uh, without due process protection, where they risk significant sentences. Um, and they are being, their statements are being beaten out of them uh, with very little uh, credible evidence apart from that. So we've got to start to challenge this. We've got to ensure that this is given the right level of international attention, because if it was anywhere else in the world, we would be up in arms. Because, mm. I mean, the, the use of military courts in under the Mubarak dictatorship in Egypt was a, a, a central concern of the 25th of January revolution, wasn't it? Certainly, yeah. And, and when, when we look at that in other countries, the, the, the use of military courts is, is, is something that, that we are quite willing to, to speak out about. Uh, if you look at, uh, from, from my own uh, experience, of working in uh, post-conflict Bosnia, where large numbers of people were put on trial in military courts, um, we were up in arms about that. Um, that process was stopped. Civilian courts were established, and, and people who had committed crimes were put on trial in, in properly regulated civilian courts. That's how a democracy functions. Mm. Uh, you cannot have a democracy without the rule of law. Mm. Diana, I mean, uh, uh, you have a background, as you were saying, in, in, in South Africa. Now, there's been um, uh, some criticism of the, uh, of the BDS movement and other Palestinian activists for using the term apartheid about, uh, about uh, Israel. It's become increasingly one which is used, especially since the separation wall, the so-called apartheid war, was, uh, uh, was erected. Uh, do, do, you think it's a, do you think it's a useful uh, and sensible term to use? 
Um, apartheid in South Africa was different. But if we look at the UN definition of apartheid, um, uh, which, which effectively suggests that people are treated differently and unequally because of something over which they have no control, namely their nationality in this case, then Israel does fit, as I would see it, an apartheid uh, definition. I tend to use the word privilege, Jewish privilege, and I feel I can use it. Unfortunately, that is a problem. Jewish people sometimes have a right to say things, those of us who are dissidents, which other people don't have. Um, so on the whole, I would say that uh, there is not a problem in my mind of using the word apartheid, although on, personally I don't use it. There's one thing I must say here that I wanted to add about military courts. Mm. There is only one country in the world which uses military courts for children, and that is Israel. Mm. It's the only country. And this is something, when Israel tries to pretend how wonderful it is and what a marvellous state it is, this is something it needs to mm. hold and to be condemned for. Mm. I mean, uh, Martin, the, the the apartheid tag has, has stuck, uh, <coughs> has become, I think you could say, it. <laughs> it's not it's not uncontroversial, but it has become more widely widely accepted. Do you think it's a, it, it's a it's a, a graphic and therefore an effective way of bringing home to people what the nature of the Israeli state is? Well, yes. I mean, President Carter used it. He was criticised at the time, but I think uh, uh, subsequent events have, have shown that he was right. It's used increasingly. Uh, in America, and it's used also by many Israeli politicians. And of course, John Kerry used the word himself, admittedly, as a future possibility, but he warned the Israelis when and they, they had to apologize pretty quickly. Well, of course, he, he, he used it, uh, and then uh, there was the row, uh, and then he apologized. But of course, we the fact that he used it shows that he meant it. You can't, when you use a word like that, you can't very well re retract it. I didn't mean it, because he clearly did mean it. Mm. And of course, he was right to, 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 to use that word. Uh, um, one can see roads in, roads in the West Bank where there's a, a road for settlers and par running alongside it, a road for Palestinians. Mm. And what, uh, that never even happened in South Africa. It's a it's clear case of, I mean, it was the wall that triggered it, really, wasn't it? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, again, I mean, there were bound to stand in South Africa, but yeah. there wasn't a giant wall actually preventing movement. Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, uh, of course, the, the Israelis themselves call it Hasbara. Uh, if you look up in a, in, a, um, uh, uh, in a Hebrew dictionary, you'll find that that means separate... Hasfara, I'm sorry, the wrong word. You, it, that means separation. Uh, apartheid is simply the Dutch word for apartness, separation. So, in other words, the, the Israelis are arguing just about a linguistic thing. They call it themselves separation. We call it apartheid, which means separation. What is the argument? Mm. Is that the way you read it? Yes, uh, I do read it uh, that way. Um, well, literally, I There's suppose. lots and lots of ways. Desmond Tutu himself said he finds what what what's going on in the occupied territories worse than apartheid. And what's, I, I mean, I, I just want to mention something that um, I've been in, di I went to a Jewish school and I was in dialogue with one of the students who was very anxious about the idea that um, Israel was an apartheid state and, uh, you know, he tried to, produce evidence that it wasn't. But um, his main, his piece, his real point that he kept coming back to was, well, de Klerk, you know, who was mm. the last prime minister of white South Africa, says it's not an apartheid state, so therefore it can't be. And now even de Klerk has come out with a statement that it is an apartheid state. Unfortunately, the dialogue ended because he had to have write his A level. So uh, I hope to, uh, <laughs> to come back later, to yes. it sometime. Yes. So, so 
Tell me, so really what we're looking at with the setup, I mean, because it, it is a kind of, uh, a, well, rather like South Africa, it's a kind of slaveholders democracy, isn't it? The, the, the rule of law and the, the uh, democratic procedures only really exist for um, Israeli citizens and, and everybody else is in a, a different world. Yeah. Um, Quite simply, and, and I can add to, uh, to what, what the other guests have said, and, and we mustn't forget that apartheid itself is, is a crime recognised um, by the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. So, you know, it is, it is a crime within the jurisdiction of that court itself. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to argue any other way that that's not the situation. Um, and, you know, as we've heard, it's probably more more the case in Israel than it was the case in, in South Africa. So it's, it's very difficult to see how one can argue against that, yet do nothing to remedy that. And, and I think that's, that's the concern that we have, is that we all recognize that this is the case. Um, but again, we go back to, we're too afraid to take any punitive action against Israel to remedy that situation. And I think that's the, the, the part that we have to get over, not convincing ourselves that what's going on is wrong, because I think any, any sensible, logical person will, will recognize that the rule of law has collapsed for a segment of society, and that needs to change. Mm. Martin, do you think that this, uh, these recent wave of, uh, of arrests and shootings, um, do you think they're anywhere near the point where it might spark another intifada, another rebellion amongst Palestinians, or do you think that the, the place where the politics is being played out now is, a, is in the unity government? Well, uh, that, that is certainly a fear, but I mean, I think the Palestinians have learnt, and uh, the great majority of them have learnt and understand that um, while they, they have a right to resist the occupation, they have a right to protest, um, it is not wise for them to take up arms again, as they did in the Second Intifada. Uh, and um, uh, the Israelis are almost trying to provoke them into doing that. Um, it, because then it becomes much more simple for them to justify their, <clears throat> their occupation by saying, well, we have to do this for security reasons. Uh, it's only when uh, the Palestinians behave in a non-violent way that it makes, it makes it difficult for the for the Israelis to justify the occupation. And one thing that is very under-reported uh, and under-appreciated in this country is that there is a massive non-violent protest movement in, uh, in, in the West Bank, in, in Palestine. Uh, and there are uh, villages where they have um, demonstrations, against, usually against the wall, but sometimes against uh, seizure of land, against the um, attacks on, on, on their olive groves. Um, every Friday or, or every Saturday over the last 10 or 15 years, um, this is the longest running non-violent protest movement the world has ever seen, longer than Mahatma Gandhi's in India, longer, well, maybe not longer than the um, movement in South Africa, but of course that wasn't entirely non-violent. Mm. And, and it is a very, very uh, courageous and interesting movement. Usually on these demonstrations, the, they, they, the organizers say it's a non-violent demonstration. One or two uh, teenagers may throw the odd stone uh, and, and they discourage it very strongly, but, but it happens. So it's wrong to, to focus entirely on the, the, the little bit of stone throwing. The big picture is that there is a massive non-violent protest movement. The Israeli response is what we should worry about. The Israeli response to non-violent protest is to use rubber bullets, uh, rubber-coated bullets, to use live ammunition, uh, to use tear gas, uh, to use pepper spray, and various other uh, very aggressive uh, and dangerous uh, arms. Well, 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 how do you see the, the, the Palestinian response to this latest wave of, of, of repression? Do you think it, it, it could produce a struggle on the scale of the Intifada, or do you think it's, it's different this time? What seems to me to be happening is that the Palestinians are saying, we do not want the Palestinian Authority to work with Israel, because the Israel has outsourced its security in the way occupied Palestinian territories to Palestinian Authority mm. um, uh, soldiers. And what came through very strongly was that the Israeli army went into all the Area A 
and the Palestinian Authority soldiers stayed, stayed back and allowed them free reign. And I think what happened was I saw that they were stoning their own soldiers and saying, you are collaborators. So it seems to me that like in all situations like this, there has to be unity. And I'm not sure whether it is the, the, the position of the Palestinian Authority, I think, is now becoming increasingly unacceptable to the people. OK, well, I'm afraid that uh, on that very serious question, we're going to have to leave this week's day, this, the day's discussion because uh, that uh, brings us to the end of this edition of analysis. I'd like to thank my guests for an insightful and informed discussion, and uh, I hope that you've enjoyed it at home and that you'll uh, make sure that you tune into future editions of analysis. You can follow us, of course, on Twitter. The address is below on the screen or on Facebook at the Islam Channel Current Affairs page. But until next time, good night.